Namaste, Jill. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Uh, so growing up in Canada, you were born in Montreal and you grew up mm -hmm. both in Montreal and Toronto. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of your earliest recollections of either of nonviolence or violence? Right. I mean, I think um, the uh, experience with violence that I first remember uh, was when I was in about grade eight. So I must have been 13, around 13 years old. And I was walking home and I saw a very, very poor man approach me, uh, what we used to call a rubby, you know, a kind of a very poor, perhaps uh, also had imbibed a bit of alcohol. And he came towards me and asked me for money. And I was, you know, trying to find some change and feeling very uncomfortable and, and gave him something. But it was the first time I really remember Rajni thinking there's something wrong uh, because I go to such a good school. I live in such a beautiful city. Why is it that some people are suffering uh, this kind of condition. And I remember going home and asking my mother and saying, you know, um, how to help people like this. And she said, Jill, there's so many, we do what we can, um, but you know, um, this condition will continue. And I, I thought, does this mean that this is a kind of structural violence. I didn't have that terminology then, but I just thought, is this something that is within our whole society? And it was a bit of a wake up call for me to see that I was very privileged and there was a lot of people who were not. And somehow felt I lived within a bubble. And I think thereafter, I was always keen to burst that bubble and to get out and to see the real world, which I considered many more people were living um, in a poorer state than I was. So yeah. that uh, is my first recollection of, and I saw that as violence. I saw that as violating our humanness when we can't look after our, especially our elderly people. So that was the first experience. Uh, what would be your earliest recollection of the term Ahimsa or of Gandhi? Yes, so I learned about Gandhi first in my world affairs class in grade 12, I think. Um, and I was just taken by it. Um, and I remember writing an essay. And I also remember uh, studying Tolstoy. And um, these became two, uh, War and Peace and Gandhi's in Suraj became known to me uh, at that time. And there was an attraction to it. Mm -hmm. I think probably because they just, you know, elevated the, our higher selves and it felt good. And I think it, it you know, it elevated um, my, to a higher self. And I like that. I, I, I remember studying ancient Greek and Latin and thinking the beauty of studying the Greek heroes or you know, um, some of the Greek writers, is it, it's elevating, it ennobles one. But I think particularly because I was struck by injustice at an early age, I was particularly gravitating towards Tolstoy who was abolishing slavery uh, within the context of war and peace. And, and um, uh, Gandhi who was talking about indentured labor in South Africa and, how to bring people out of slavery. So those were things that captured me at an early age, yes. What about the influence of your grandfather who had to flee uh, Georgia uh, in what then later became the Soviet Union uh, because of the persecution uh, of the incoming uh, communist regime? Uh, how did his life trajectory and perhaps even his personality shape you? 
I mean, my grandfather was um, a, a, an aristocrat. You know, he came from a Georgian princely background. He was not particularly treated well in Toronto because, uh, you know, Toronto didn't really, the, the community there didn't really understand his background. But he was always telling us about how, um, since he was uprooted during the time of the Bolshevik invasion and much of his properties was taken over by the communist uh, and he lost, you know, when he was studying in Cambridge, he was, he lost all his railway bonds because the, the railways were nationalized. And, uh, he, but you know, he never, um, he always said that he allied himself with the Mensheviks, that he believed in a more um, equitable society, egalitarian society. And um, he told us many stories uh, about how he would go down to the stables because they had horses and really befriend the, the, um, the stable hands who were looking after the horses feeling a camaraderie with them. And even in Canada, I recall him always never changing his voice when he talked to laborers, always treating them with uh, dignity and gracefulness. And, and so surely that had an, an impression on our family. Yeah, but was there also an issue of the violence of a revolution versus uh, change a profound social change, but without violence. Was that also an emergent issue? No, I think that only came to me intellectually much later when I studied the Russian Revolution. Uh, and then I did go to Georgia and I saw how the revolution, um, especially Georgia, the ancestral place of my grandfather where Stalin was from and saw you know, the millions of kulaks that Stalin uh, killed, of course there was an awareness uh, of the horrors of this. And, uh, you know, we grew up, I think, really believing the world could be nonviolent. That was the beauty of growing up in Canada. You know, there, it was open to the world in the 60s and 70s and believing that world peace was possible. And the first time that I went, I didn't, uh, I haven't told you this before, Rajni, the first time I went to the United Nations before getting a job there was I went in a, 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 a peace um, a parade, a march, a, a march, in fact, uh, in 1982 when we were fighting for disarmament. So, but before we get into the details of how you became a nonviolent strainer, um, maybe we should cover your work for South South Solidarity, which is uh, you were a co-founder of a South South Solidarity Network uh, in the 1980s. You at that time you were working. It's I think in sequence in, in India, Bangladesh, and Philippines. Uh, so, in what ways did you uh, firstly, understand South South Solidarity. How was it defined? And in what ways did you hope that it could be a counter to the structural violence uh, which was persisting exactly. long after formal colonization had, uh, had had supposedly ended? That's right. So in the 1980s, I spent five years at the United Nations and towards in UNDP. Uh, and I was working to help set up the NGO office there. And in the second to last year that I was there, there was the African famine and drought. And there were all these Africans that came, government leaders, Rajni, that came to talk about the famine. But we invited the NGO sector. And we, I remember in 1984 sitting there and realizing how unresponsive the UN was to civil society in the global south and how the agency and the active participation of civil society from south countries was absolutely necessary to make the UN a better place, make it more accountable 
because most of the nations came from the global south, uh, the group of 77, which later became 125. So um, when I went to India and left the UN out of a sense of not really delivering to poor people and set up South-South Solidarity in 1986, uh, our intention was to really focus on civil society leaders in India that could travel to other South countries, look, teach and learn, you know, uh, share their experiences, technologies, dreams and ideas, and build development prescription that was not coming from the North, the industrialized North, that was coming out of poverty situations, situations uh, which we call poverty, but just common ordinary situations of people. And it would have led to a much better development had we had more South-South connection, both within the UN multilateral institutions, uh, but also just generally. The problem was, is that civil society leaders in India were reticent to go to Africa. They much preferred to go to Europe because they saw that as mobility and uh, somehow more interesting, just as the Africans preferred to go to Europe rather than India. So it took quite a bit of pushing and pulling people together for them to see the value of those kinds of relationships. And similarly with Asia or South Asia in particular, a building around issues like floods and droughts, agroecological issues, because we're a contiguous unit by territory. And so our water resources are connected, our forest is connected. So there was a real uh, reason to bring people more together. And uh, I was very, very happy about that experience because it sensitized me to the depth of development understanding that we had both in India and that existed in these other countries, which were never valued in international development programs because it was always decided around the goods and services that Northern countries were bringing to the South. And so um, it gave me uh, a great respect uh, for what India had done. And I think it also, it led me to go back to Gandhi insofar as in India, I became aware of the influence of Gandhi in, uh, in the whole development of, of India in especially the 25 years after his death up to say globalization in the 1980s. I became so aware of the influence that Gandhi and, and Gandhian leaders or those Sarvudiya leaders had on our development that it, I took that knowledge much later into the Jai Jagat campaign, um, which we started to conduct from 2016 onwards, um, so much later. Yeah. But yeah, but I think the South South um, networking came to a little bit of a bump in the road as India became more uh, interested in being a superpower because it then became more dif difficult to say, no, you're one player in SARC. No, we have to look at other South countries and respect them even if they're much smaller. And indeed, there was lots of uh, South cooperation programs that started by the South Commission under Manmohan Singh and many exchanges have taken place. But there was never the valuing of the South knowledge and exchange that could have been there that would have really enriched the plurality of India's development policies and strategies. And uh, so I, I regret that that sort of went down, even though I passed so south to Indian friends, friends from Bangladesh and Nepal, and they ran it thereafter, but it only ran for an additional 10 years before it just sunk 
because mm -hmm. the political interest in that also waned. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what was yeah. the journey from this work on the UN platforms and these very kind of transnational networks of South-South solidarity from that to becoming a non-violence trainer and a full-time <coughs> activist of the Ekta Parishad uh, at the grassroots of uh, Indian society. Uh, and, and I know that in that process, you also were drawn into a much deeper exploration of both Gandhi and peace education, which is what your uh, PhD is about. So if you could just uh, a describe yes. the transition and then we'll get to what exactly is nonviolence training. You see, what I realized in development is I could come from the West or from the UN and be a development expert, but I wanted the trust and love of people as not just handing out money. As soon as you have money, people will dance. As soon as the money's over, the dance stops. I wanted to see what was sustainable, especially um, in India where there were five-year programs and you know, money came, money went, priorities changed. I really wanted to understand what is sustainable? What can villagers themselves carry? What is their aspirations? How can they become leaders? In doing that, I had to become one of those communities. I could not do it as an outsider. Now, I appreciate with my white face and English Canadian accent, I would never be able to be fully integrated. But I also knew that I could open my heart as wide as possible and people would respond to that and really treat me as part of their family. You know, I, I remember some of my women village friends who would try to comb my hair down with oil and put a bindi and put a little dirt on my cheeks to make me look a little browner and uh, you know taught me how to flip uh, uh, chapatis on a smokeless chula at rapid rate you know and uh, so I, I really um, I had a deep experience uh, with women in villages to such an extent that it changed me dramatically. It made me realize that all this education and affluence in which I was uh, born into uh, didn't teach me basic things about development, about how to manage production, how to work, how to uh, be self-reliant. And it was really women that gave me that understanding, how to be resilient. Women really taught me about injustice, how they saw their environment, how they saw Swaraj. And, and it really prepared me for nonviolent movement making, which I later understood, Rajni, was really connected to the grassroots. We can study nonviolence in middle class circles, but if we want a nonviolent development, we have to begin from the bottom, you know. Uh, in an inclusive process. So uh, this is how uh, I, I love to use this example of Narmada as a way to show this connection. So Narmada was from Damo district in Madhya Pradesh and she was a beautiful woman uh, who had no education. She was born a Dalit. She lived in a, a, a nice village near 900 acres of beautiful forest and she married an Adivasi. And so she was um, able to get uh, some leadership training within Ekta Parishad. And as a result of that, she got more confidence, saw herself more as a village leader, came back to her village. And there was a big struggle over this 900 acre forest because the tree fellers wanted to come in. They were getting supported by the government, the, uh, the district forest of, uh, officials. And initially the men went and tried to stop them, but they were put in jail. So then the women acted. And Narmada said, 
they, they went to the forest, circled them, told them in very harsh terms, but, but quietly, you have to, firmly, you have to stop. Uh, to such an extent, they were even prepared to take their dirty baby diapers and throw them at these fellows, but they resisted. And, um, you know, slowly these people went off thinking they would return. Then they marched to the, the uh, jail. They sat for three days, fasted in front of the jail. The district authorities didn't know what to do because the media was starting to find out about this and slowly, slowly released the husbands. And uh, over a period of a little more struggle time, they were able to keep this 900 acre forest. And this was their livelihood. This was where they got their food, fodder and fuel resources. Jim, what and it year, was, approximately what year would this have been in? Okay, so she did her um, leadership training in the 90s, I would say before 95. And I was with her after 2000, between 2002 and 2010. Uh, and why I say 2010 is that she got so recognized in some of our marches and other things for her leadership that she got the Europe Prize um, in 2010. This is a prize that comes from the Rural Women's Award Committee in Geneva. They recognized her, they came, they gave her an award. I mean, it was so amazing for Narmada to get this. And in fact, when she died in 2016 of breast cancer, which we all were so sad about, she went with a great you know, at least she really felt she had done something. And she said that in her last days. And so it, it's these kind of women that not only uh, bring together groups at the bottom and create pressure uh, for their empowerment and land rights and so on, but they also uh, uh, act nonviolently to create a way forward for these communities to get their land rights uh, mm. through you know, uh, political represent, re representatives. And I think um, that nonviolent movement building, which Narmada was engaged in, taught me how valuable nonviolence was and how if they didn't have the nonviolent strategies in their hand, they could be easily um, uh, put down by government authorities. The nonviolent movement building brought groups together that became very strong in their commitment uh, for maintaining land rights and for um, having a nonviolent development. And so this is where I became a front seat learner on nonviolent movements and then slowly myself participated in many nonviolent actions, which then led me to realize somewhere around 2010, I think, that I need to, to really work on nonviolent development because we need a vision beyond just fighting for land rights. We need to look at where poor, poor marginalized communities have land and what does that look like? Uh, and so uh, this is when I began to realize that I needed to go back to school, learn more about nonviolence, so I could understand more deeply nonviolent development and, and work not only with the um, poorer communities, but also middle class communities to get them to endorse and support nonviolent development. So I think that was um, the trajectory. And at what stage in this did you start holding uh, nonviolence trainings yourself within the Ikta Parishad network? Well, I was with women on training from 2001 when we set up the women's wing. So, but I didn't really know that it was not, I thought I was doing land uh, rights and 
women's development. And it suddenly dawned on me that without nonviolence, this land rights wouldn't work. Um, and so I kind of uh, became aware of it probably around 2008, 2009, specifically when I realized that I myself as a, as a non-Indian person by face, not by heart, by face, was being targeted by uh, political people as being somehow e evangelizing or somehow coming to bring negative Western influences into villages. And so I realized that I too had to uh, use nonviolence to overcome that. And so how I did it was I, I focused much more on nonviolent training uh, in the tradition of Gandhi. And then that, of course, uh, put me in a different um, category, if you will, uh, of what I was doing. So it came out of compulsion and it came out of uh, and, it, and a gradual enlightenment. I think both. Yeah, um, oh, I'm sure uh, P.V. Rajgopal played a role in this because the two of you got married in what, 2000? 2000. 2000, yes. I mean, I knew him from 93 onwards and I saw how difficult the Gandhian nonviolent life was. And so I was reticent to get married earlier. It took me many years to understand as a feminist that Gandhi was a very uh, positive social vision. You know, it took me a while. I had to go through my own critiques uh, because I came from the West. I came from a Western feminism. I came from a, a position of wanting to see women's development. And uh, so it took, I saw the Gandhian community as being quite a male hierarchy. I even saw Ekta Parishad as being a base of 80% women, but a lot of men in the leadership. And so it took me a long time to figure out how to deal with that conflict of patriarchy uh, nonviolently. And, and, uh, and to appreciate that Gandhi gave me a lot of clues in that. And <clears throat> surely, you know, uh, when, when uh, Raj Gopal and I were married in 2000, um, that was when I agreed to take this path uh, because I knew that it was not a path, a middle-class path. It was not an easy path. I would immediately be going to villages and living more, you know, uh, uh, in, in sometimes uh, challenging situations. Uh, but um, uh, I was so taken by how people were changed and transformed with nonviolence that I wanted to be part of it. So, yeah. That, uh, so, uh, what does the nonviolence training entail? Because, you know, many people who are going to watch this may or may not ever have an opportunity. Uh, to actually uh, join such a training. So can you just very briefly um, describe what happens inside a nonviolence training? So a nonviolent training uh, is tailored to the people you're working with. There's no one prescriptive training. There are some principles that you use or some directions that are common. But clearly, if you're training grassroots women on land rights, or you're cha uh, training Colombian youth from, from um, Colombia, these are going to be very different trainings. They're going to start from where the people are at. You cannot impose a bottom, you cannot talk about a bottom-up development without starting from the participants' position in their development. Uh, in their societies. So obviously uh, there is a need to constantly adapt. But what is common for those people who have not taken the training is to first of all realize that nonviolence exists. 
Many people don't think it exists. Many people see violence existing and nonviolence as a way to stop violence from being too harsh. But they don't see nonviolence as having a existence and a being. And, and, and therefore, as, and, and, and as being as a, uh, they don't see nonviolence as a proactive phenomenon. As a proactive phenomenon. And so to get them into that perspective, Rajni, takes a bit of time, you know, because there's a lot of skepticism that you work through. Um, and once people believe that nonviolent exists, then you work on strategies. Like, for instance, preempting conflict is a very vital part of dealing with conflict. You see a conflict arising, you try to derail it before it arises. You don't get drawn into it. You have to hold your non-reactive self and try to preempt violence. If violence is there, you have strategies for dealing with minimizing violence, for finding humor, for finding allies, for developing um, a posturing uh, to deal with, with that. So uh, you want to if first preempt it. If that doesn't work, you want to reduce it. If that doesn't work, then you know you basically uh, have to say that nonviolence is limited in very violent situations and sometimes cannot be a viable solution. For instance, in the middle of a war, you can't expect uh, nonviolence always to work. I mean, we have nonviolence peace force, which tries to be between two sides, but it doesn't necessarily stop the conflict. Um, so there are limitations and you need to discuss that in terms of real nonviolent uh, conflict. And to say that sometimes when nonviolent, when violent conflict is raging, you have to wait for the moment of intervention. It's very, the timing is very important for an intervention. You know, I often think of Rwanda with the Tutsis and Hutus who fought and, and, and killed each other. There was a huge genocide of a million people. And it took, uh, it took a long time to have those community reconciliation meetings, bringing thousands of groups together over a period of five years that began to turn the tide. So nonviolence is slow. It's not fast. It doesn't offer a, an easy solution. It's, it's, it's sometimes very slow and it requires deep patience. And so part of nonviolent training is being very patient, is being very calm, is not having expectations that are too high. Mm. And also accepting that we may lose a battle, but we may win the war. You know, I believe in today's world, there's a lot of raging violence, but I also believe that we can contain much of this violence and people need a lot more training and ability to do that containing of this violence. And uh, conflict, nonviolent conflict resolution, Rajni should be taught in schools, like reading, writing, arithmetic. Yeah. It should be taught so that children themselves can find nonviolent solutions. It doesn't have to go to the principal. It doesn't have to be the parents who decide. The, the children who are in a con conflicting relationship need to learn how to solve those problems. And this is where I think education plays a very entering, yeah. a very, very important part in providing the skills and capacities to people to handle violence. Yeah. In this context, Jill, as, uh, as one of the co-founders of the Jai Jagat campaign, which is a global uh, peace campaign founded on Gandhian values, you have interacted with people across the world. 
yes. uh, some of them are famous activists some of them are young people who are just setting out on the path uh, they come from different walks of life so what are some of the inspirations from these many interactions that you've had that you know you could share here which have uh, both let's talk about it at both levels the inspirations that have strengthened your resolve for non violence but also challenges that have yes. uh, highlighted for you as you said the limitations and the problems that you face on this path so the what has um, been very inspiring for me and i i believe for others is when you build a group so i think of the women's groups that we built and rajni the fact that we were together in these women's groups uh was something was so positive and so celebrate celebratory you know we celebrated through dance and music because women don't often get time off to just be with women and play and have fun and share a deep sense of sisterhood and and this uh uh at the grassroots level really taught me uh how inspiring beautiful groups of women can be when they come together to face a social challenge i think um with many of the youth um it's been uh an incredible incredibly inspiring to watch any kind of transformation you know watching them transform makes you feel you know that you've transformed also with them uh i have seen hundreds of people uh not only in my own training work but in other uh, like rajgopals and other ekta parishad colleagues and other nonviolent trainers i've seen really a lot of people transform transform so that they they are able to deal with not only their inner violence but they're able to embrace external violence and bring a a nonviolent response forward and this this is uh when you see it a uh, number of times you really believe that it's very possible and that you know you recommunicate it and you inspire others the challenges have been that um you know uh that we expected probably um that um india uh after the 150 years of gandhi's birthday would be really keen to take gandhi outside india i think yes but no i mean i didn't see that huge response uh among indians i'm not just talking about the government of india among indians to really see um what we were doing and um so probably my expectation was higher um and i was even though we walked in the jai jagat through various countries like armenia four or five months later they were in a civil war with azerbaijan so clearly you think you're making great strides and you feel you're taking two steps forward but you are not happy when you take the three steps back and again you have to take steps forward so it's a very challenging i think uh to conclude the challenging piece i began to realize um and from from many people's work including yours rajni that unless we decentralize the economy we cannot decentralize power and without decentralizing power and governance we can't be more inclusive and therefore um decentralizing economy looking at a different kind of economy is absolutely central and we have a, a huge behemoth of an economy globally that's not easy to change i mean it's 
It's, it's a huge force. Uh, and uh, I know many people who are working on nonviolent economy, not only at the grassroots, academically and civil society, and even in government, um, but it's a big challenge. And we are not um, starry-eyed about the challenges ahead. The, it is a big challenge and uh, you just have to decide as Gandhi uh, advocated that we just work on the means and don't worry about the end, that we have to just keep going in these good nonviolent efforts and the end will take care of itself. So we continue with this, but we know the challenges. We've seen um, uh, so much evidence of those challenges, particularly uh, on the level of economic globalization and its marginalizations of millions, its destruction of the planet. It's bringing so much violence. It's creating so much hate and polarization. So that is why the Jai Jagat talks about the four pillars that we have to eradicate poverty, we have to reduce discrimination, we have to uh, handle the climate crisis, and we have to stop or, or bring down violence. And this is, is really uh, why I, I continue with such hope is because I found meaning in the Jai Jagat uh, to carry on uh, to push for nonviolence in spite of those challenges. Yeah. Uh, Jill, if you could say a little bit more about the four months that the Jai Jagat March was traveling through India. Uh, so for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the Jai Jagat story, it was a march that began on the 2nd of October 2019 and was to culminate in Geneva in October 2020. Uh, and it was, shut, it was cut short because of COVID, uh, but by then it had reached Armenia. Uh, and from yes. October to the end of January uh, 2020, you were marching in India. So that's right. Can you say a little bit about? See, I know that in many places the Yatra was very warmly received. Yes. And uh, this at a time when there is so much proliferation of hatred and uh, kind of almost glamorization of random yes. violence. So yes. what was the, to what extent did those four months uh, give you a morale boost and to what extent did they highlight the challenges for you? So uh, walking in India, you know, we were initially going to walk Rajni two months in India, two months in Bang uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. A war came six weeks before we were going to start. Our whole route had to change. We then walked from, instead of Delhi to the um, border of Pakistan, we walked from Delhi to Sev uh, Varda Sevagram, Gandhi's uh, main ashram. Uh, this was about 25 kilometers, 2,500 kilometers that we did over four months with 50 people from all around the world in a kind of a global community of very diverse uh, people. And uh, what was amazing about that march was that almost every day we got a school to sleep in and we got at least two meals a day. And these were contributed by villagers or sometimes by the district officials, sometimes by middle-class friends, sometimes by temples, gudwaras, mosques. But in every case, we found that we were looked after. And this was peace. I mean, this is peace. At the same time, we were being looked after. We were doing education in the communities. I think we touched 75,000 young people as we walked in these four months in India. Directly. And directly, these are young people 75,000. Engaged with directly. We're not talking about maybe the millions who saw you walk by. No, 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 no. We stopped at schools. Yeah. There was one meeting of 25,000 youth in Chindwara. So already a third we did in one meeting. 
so it was a huge, uh, 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 you know, experience, both for the 50 and for the people who were interfacing or interacting. So I think um, this was just a joyous and momentous occasion. Uh, thereafter, we sent a team to Pakistan, a team to Nepal, a team to UAE, and a team to Iran, and we connected the team from Iran uh, through the mountains of Armenia, and then all these teams met in Armenia for two weeks before the march was canceled. So it was a tragedy because everybody brought all these rivers, all came together, ready to go through six countries to Geneva, and it stopped. But you know, like the Indian-Pakistan conflict where we had to change our program, the pandemic taught us that in nonviolence, you have to adapt. You have to adapt to circumstance. We couldn't have brought COVID to the local people. Then they would have had no interest in peace and justice. So we needed to break it up. But you know what is interesting is the French who went back to France in, in August, uh, in, in uh, four or five months later, after the stopping of the march, they marched for one month into Geneva and got there at the appointed hour and took our documents. And in a way it gave a kind of a completion, but what was unique is all of these were French people on a Gandhian march into Geneva. There was not one Indian there. And so they had taken this notion of the salt satyagraha, which is so well known in India, but not well known in other countries, and really taken that idea and that inspiration and brought it to Geneva. And I think we're so lucky to have now this network of two, 300 groups across 20 countries, which is constantly interacting and building campaigns for Jai Jagat, and they all want to go to 2030 now. They said the march was not enough, you know, we're going to do many actions. And so we just completed 12 days of action together. But it, you know, um, this kind of giving hope to people that peace is possible, that nonviolence is possible is so rich. People want to hear it. People are waiting to hear it, but you have to get through the, the skeptical ones as well and reach them and bring them on side and, uh, and tell them that, you know, uh, we were just basically born to be peaceful and these structures of our economy and politics have led us down a very violent path. And we've got to turn this around if we want to have one planet and uh, a harmonious uh, set of relationships between the countries. So that's uh, why Jai Jagat was uh, so energizing, so amazing. You know, I, I love that you talked about how the women dancing together and singing together is an important part of their nonviolence striving because in Ganesh Devi's Ahimsa conversation, he says that if you want to work for nonviolence, dream and sing. So in closing, Jill, can you share just one or two thoughts on, you know, what can young people do to build their inner strength? Because many young people want to walk this path. They sometimes feel the, daunted. I think, um, you know, that young people need to have faith in themselves and be prepared to put themselves into an unknown situation. You can only create another world if you go into the unknown. You cannot be comfortable, stay with what you know, be completely risk averse and make change. So, we need to have this confidence in ourselves as young people. And we need to try, even if we fail, we need to turn adversity into advantage. 
And this is what young people, um, I saw them do on our march and I've seen hundreds do over the course of the many years I've worked in development. It is possible, they can overcome. And we as a older generation need to give them that confidence and not try to just say money, uh, you know, the idols of money and power uh, is what they should focus on. Uh, change requires that one change in order to be the change. And uh, I think young people are really looking for a different world. We wouldn't have the Greta Thunbergs or um, the many young people who are standing up on climate change if, if we didn't see that in those young hearts and souls, there was a deep desire to have a different world. We need, as nonviolent activists, to give them the skills of nonviolence in that change process. Thank you so much. 